Good morning. Welcome to the gathering on this wonderful. Woo! Yeah. I'm oh, sorry. I'm really awake. Not that half of you guys aren't. Welcome online if you are here. Let's all stand and wave at one another, COVID style. Good morning. Hello. Hello. We have people on the balcony. We have people in the middle. We got people up there. A lot of people up there. We're going to get started and sing some praises to our Lord and King. He is the Lion. He is the Lamb. He's our conqueror, he's also the sacrifice. Let's sing this together. Oh 
guys may take a seat. Wow, it's great to be here. You are a beautiful, wonderful looking group. Well, those of you who are watching, you're beautiful too. I can see you right through the camera. So we welcome you to worship. Um, We've all been welcome. We've waved at one another. Uh, wave at those uh, who are watching and streaming right now, joining us. Thank you for being here for worship. Um, a lovely morning, lovely weekend, a lot of things going on. Uh, just a report from uh, yesterday. Uh, 65 persons were here, and in 90 minutes, we packed 1,000 backpacks for Guatemala. How about that? God is good, and may his love and grace follow those backpacks and reach the hearts of all those kids in Guatemala as they open those backpacks. You be praying, you be praying for them. Uh, a few things this, uh, this Wednesday, uh, Face to Faith on the 5th Wednesday is happening in our children's ministry out in the parking lot. Uh, you will see all this in your uh, order of worship and the announcements there with uh, more details, but be aware of that. Some Children's ministry, things are uh, cranking up on Wednesday. Uh, this coming Wednesday, Dr. Hood will be leading a prayer and Bible study time at 6.30 right here in the sanctuary. Uh, nursery will be available during AM services beginning October the 4th, so you'll need to sign up for that. And also, Sunday school for K through 5th grade will be beginning October 4th as well, and sign up for that. Mask will be required. and. Um, so some of the kids' stuff is beginning to crank up and uh, watch the website and just call the church if you have uh, questions about that. So um, we want to pray for Pastor Justin this morning, too. Uh, he was supposed to be doing this announcement, but Justin, feel better, man. We're praying for you. So um, y'all take care. Welcome to worship. Uh, we're glad you're here this morning. Right on. Good morning. I ask that you would open your ears and open our hearts as I share with you the words of our Savior from Matthew 24. Jesus left the temple and was walking away when his disciples came up to him to call his attention to its buildings. Do you see all these things, he asked? I tell you the truth, not one stone here will be left on another. Every one will be thrown down. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. Tell us, they said, when will this happen? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Jesus answered, watch out that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name claiming, I am the Christ and will deceive many. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of birth pains. Then you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death, and you will be hated by all nations because of me. At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other, and many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold, but he who stands firm to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. So when you see standing in the holy place the abomination that causes desolation, spoken of through the prophet Daniel, let the reader understand then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let no one on the roof of his house go down to take anything out of his house. Let no one in the field go back to get his cloak. How dreadful it will be in those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers. Pray that your flight will not take place in winter or on the Sabbath. For then there will be great distress, unequaled from the beginnings of the world until now and never to be equaled again. If those days had not been cut short, no one would survive. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be shortened. At that time, if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or there he is, do not believe it. 
For false Christs and false prophets will appear and perform great signs and miracles to deceive even the elect, if that were possible. See, I have told you ahead of time. So if anyone tells you there he is out in the desert, do not go out. Or here he is in the inner room, do not believe it. For as lightning that comes from the east is visible even in the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Wherever there is a carcass, the vultures will gather. Immediately after the distress of these days, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will fall from the sky, and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. At that time, the Son of the Man will appear in the sky, and all the nations of the earth will mourn. They will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory, And he will send his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds, from one end of the heavens to the other. Now learn this lesson from the fig tree. As soon as its twigs get tender and its leaves come out, you know that summer is near. Even so, when you see all these things, you know that it is near, right at the door. I tell you the truth, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. No one knows about that day or hour, not even the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, People were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, up to the day Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. That is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Two men will be in the field. One will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding with a hand mill. One will be taken and the other left. Therefore keep watch, because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known at what time of night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and would not have let his house be broken into. So you also must be ready, because the Son of Man will come in an hour when you do not expect him. Who then is the faithful and wise servant? whom the master has put in charge of the servants in his household to give them their food at the proper time. It will be good for that servant whose master finds him doing so when he returns. I tell you the truth, he will put him in charge of all his possessions. But suppose that servant is wicked and says to himself, my master is staying away a long time, and he then begins to beat his fellow servants and to eat and drink with drunkards. The master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him, at an hour he is not aware of. He will cut him to pieces and assign him a place with the hypocrites, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the truth that it teaches us. We thank you for the warnings and for the guidance you provide us. Lord, as we continue to worship this morning, let your word meditate and sit on our hearts. Let's chew on this and speak to us. For today is your day. We pray this in your name. Amen. Let's all stand and sing. I'm going to teach you a new song about magnifying Christ in our lives. Um, I'm going to teach you the chorus, and this is what I'm encouraging everyone to sing with me during the song and just let the rest of the verses and the bridge uh, speak to you, however that might be. But the chorus is where we can all sing, Christ be magnified in us. So it goes like this. Singing, oh, Christ be magnified, let his praise arise, Christ be magnified in me. Singing, oh, Christ
sound in glory, His face I at last shall see. Swim me, my joy through the ages, to sing of His love. We thank you for this time where we can learn through scripture, where we can learn messages prepared intentionally to speak to us right now. Lord, clear all distractions, take everything that's happening around us in our own lives, in the world, in our communities, clear that away, speak to us this morning. We're here for your truth and your truth alone. Lord, we love you. We can't wait to see what you have in store for us. We pray this all in your name. Amen. You want me to take a seat? Amen. Good morning, everyone. And uh, isn't it good to be in worship together? We uh, will never take that for granted again. I want to thank uh, Jeff Keller for reading our scripture text for us this morning. It was such a long passage, I didn't want to incorporate it into the sermon itself, but uh, I hope that you will have your Bibles open to Matthew chapter 24 because we'll be looking at a number of verses there as we quickly move through a sizable chunk of scripture today. A month ago, on the morning of August 27th, Hurricane Laura made landfall at Cameron, Louisiana. It was the 10th strongest United States hurricane landfall by wind speed on record. It caused over $10 billion in damage. And everyone knew that the Category 4 hurricane was coming. It was all over the news. In fact, there were even mandatory evacuation orders issued. And multitudes of people did evacuate in preparation for the arrival of the hurricane. But some didn't. They were caught unprepared. And it cost them their lives. Over 40 of them perished because they did not prepare for the arrival of the hurricane. The Bible tells us that another even more major event is coming, the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. And it's coming on a day and time unknown to anyone but God himself. And those caught unprepared will suffer a fate Worse than death. 
Jesus says, so you also must be ready because the Son of Man will come in an hour when you do not expect him. Now, no event in the history of the world has been subjected to more speculation than the second coming of Jesus Christ. It's going on even now. This pandemic that we're experiencing has a number of people speculating and looking for the signs of the end. And in Luke's parallel to our passage today, it mentions not only famines and earthquakes, but also pestilences and plagues and fearful events. I don't know for sure if that refers to presidential elections or not, but certainly they are fearful events, aren't they? But everyone wants to know the answer to two questions. When is it going to happen? And how is it going to happen? Even the disciples are curious about that in verse 3 of the text that was read for us earlier. Now, the first of those two questions is easy to answer. When is it going to happen? No one knows. Jesus says so in verse 36. Jesus himself says no one knows about that day or hour, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. So if Jesus doesn't know, no one else knows. Make sure you hear that this morning. If Jesus doesn't know, no one else knows. Not uh, Hal Lindsey or Tim LaHaye or Harold Camping or any TV preacher or any church preacher or the Pope or anyone else. Jesus says no one knows. And no one's going to find out either because Jesus, in his divine authority, has said the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect Him. He's coming when you don't expect Him. So if you have some time to waste and want to do so, you can spend it speculating on when Jesus is going to return. That's the when question. Now how is another matter. And on that, Jesus gives us some instruction. And all of what he tells us in this chapter of Matthew's gospel is prompted by something he says in response to the question of the disciples, or, or, or actually the, 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 the fact that they point out the magnificence of the temple and its environs as they walk along in the beginning of that chapter. Jesus left the temple and was walking away. By, by the way, that's prophetically significant as well. Jesus had turned his back on the Jewish temple. Jesus was walking away from it for the last time, rejected by his own, by the religious leaders of his day. And the disciples, maybe they were trying to cheer him up a little bit because he had been lamenting over Jerusalem at the close of the previous chapter. And, and so they call his attention to the, to the buildings and they would have pointed out their, their size. They were huge and impressive. The temple itself, more than twice the size of the Parthenon in Greece. Or its splendor. You know, the face of the temple was layered in gold. It would have been a brilliant sight. The Jewish historian Josephus said, It was covered all over with plates of gold, layered in gold, of great weight, and at the first rising of the sun, he said, it reflected back a very fiery splendor and made those who strained to look upon it to turn their eyes away, just as they would have done at the sun's own rays. It was full of splendor and brilliance. And no one could mistake its significance in Judaism. It was the very center of Judaism. They could not have conceived of the end of the temple. The end of the temple for them would have marked the end of the world itself. But Jesus predicts its complete destruction in verse 2. He says, not, not one stone will be left on another. Every one will be thrown down. 
And that prophecy was fulfilled not much later in A.D. 70. The temple was destroyed. Titus Vespasian, the son of the emperor Vespasian, came in with his armies to take over from his father when his father had to go and, and ascend to the, to the uh, position of emperor to finish up the siege of Jerusalem. And, and when Jerusalem fell, Titus wanted to preserve the temple because of its splendor, but he couldn't get that word to his armies in time. They, they destroyed it. It was brought down. And so Jesus' words about the temple were true. They, when he spoke them, it prompted a question from the disciples. In, in verse 3, they asked him really a two-part question. Tell us, they said, when will this happen? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? A two-part question, as I said. What will, when is this going to happen? Thinking of the destruction of the temple. And, and because they associated that with the end of the world, they asked, well, what, what are the signs of the end of the age? And in response, Jesus gives them some specific instruction. And this chapter is a challenge to outline. I'm not going to do it except in very broad strokes. But all through the chapter, Jesus is speaking of two things and relating them to one another. One is the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple. The other is the, his return in the end of the age. And sometimes it's a little difficult to tell specifically which one he's talking about at which point because they have great similarities. We're going to look at them this morning. In the first 14 verses, Jesus tells them not to be deceived or alarmed. In verse 4, he warns not to be deceived. In verse 6, don't be alarmed, he says. Expect wars and famines and natural disasters and, and, and according to Luke, plagues and pestilences and, and all of these things. But in verse 6, he says, the end is still to come. It's still ahead. Persecution, deception, hardness of heart are coming, he says. But true disciples will be known by their perseverance. In verse 13, those who persevere will be the ones who are saved. But don't miss verse 14. It says, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. That's very significant. But imagine how that must have sounded to that small band of disciples. As Jesus said, this gospel will be preached in all the world, and then the end will come. They must have looked at one another and thought, who's going to do that? And realized, it must be us. They heard that, they took it seriously, and they got busy. They started to work. Might have sounded idealistic to many, but they put their faith to work and began to spread that gospel. When, as a young man, missionary Robert Morrison had first sailed to China, he was asked this question, do you really expect to make an impression on the idolatry of the great Chinese empire? And in reply, Morrison spoke more prophetically than he knew. He said, no, sir, but I expect God will. And he was right. We can see that right here in our own fellowship. We, we have a uh, uh, our Chinese brothers and sisters who are part of our congregation, our fellowship. I performed a wedding ceremony for a couple of them right here in this place this week. God can do it. And God did it through those, those few disciples that Jesus was training and leading and instructing such that the gospel covered the entire Roman world even in that generation and the gospel now has covered every continent on earth. 25 years ago, Atlantic Monthly reported that 97% of the world's population has at least part of the Bible translated into their own language. Never before in the history of humankind 
Have we had the kind of technologies that we have today such that this service can go out online? Anyone in the world with an internet connection can watch it. Do you believe that? And Jesus says, note very carefully, this is the only prerequisite for the end. All the other things that people talk about, well, this has to happen before Jesus comes back, and that has to happen, and, and the temple has to be rebuilt, and all of these kinds of things that they, they literally say have to occur. No, Jesus says just one thing. This gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed all over the earth. Then the end will come. So Jesus says, don't be deceived, don't be alarmed. And then in the next section, verses 15 down through verse 28, we read about the destruction of Jerusalem that was, that was just around the corner, as it were. And that destruction was a consequence of the Jewish rebellion against Rome from A.D. 66 to 70. The Jews finally got so tired of Roman domination, they rebelled against them, and of course, Rome was too powerful for them and came and laid siege to Jerusalem. But you need to know that the destruction of Jerusalem that Jesus predicts in this passage is a, a type, a, a pattern, a paradigm for the end of the age. In other words, the end of the age is going to be much like the, the soon-to-happen end of Jerusalem. The coming, first of Vespasian, then his son Titus, in retribution on Jerusalem, it is a cameo, it's a preview, it's a foreshadowing, a parallel of Christ's coming in judgment at the end of history. That which characterizes the one will also characterize the other. We're meant to learn from that. And verse 15 is instructive. In verse 15... Jesus says, so when you see standing in the holy place the abomination that causes desolation spoken of through the prophet Daniel, let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let the reader understand. That's a little parenthesis here that Matthew puts in. Jesus was speaking these words to his disciples, but Matthew is recording them, and, and he decides to put in this parenthesis, let the reader understand. What he's saying is, there is more here than meets the eye. Recognize what Jesus is talking about, in other words, is what he's saying. Let the reader understand. It requires some insight and some discernment to comprehend. Jesus speaks of this abomination that causes desolation and refers back to the prophet Daniel. Now, in our adult Sunday school materials, we're studying that, that book and that passage. My wife has been, she's up half the night trying to make sense out of some of those prophetic passages in Daniel to, to, to share with her Sunday school class. Jesus speaks of that abomination. And the Jews considered that prophecy of Daniel more or less to have been fulfilled by Antiochus Epiphanes in 168 BC. In the intertestamental literature, it speaks of the desecration that he brought in the temple. And Jesus uses it here. You know, Antiochus had sacrificed a, a pig on the altar the holiest altar in Judaism, and the pig was an unclean animal to the Jews. This desecration that occurred. And Jesus uses that in reference here to the Roman armies that were going to come and surround and destroy Jerusalem. We know that from the parallel in Luke's gospel. The parallel to verse 15 here in Matthew. In Luke, Luke records that Jesus also said, when you see, the, see Jerusalem being surrounded by armies, you will know that its desolation is near. Let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains, he goes on. Jesus says to hasten out of the city because the destruction will be swift and severe. And in verse 21 of Matthew's account, Jesus speaks of the distress of that time being unequaled any time before or since or ever. Unequaled distress. Now, 
Some might suggest that that's prophetic hyperbole and exaggeration. Well, Josephus, the Jewish historian, describes the distress of Jerusalem in superlative terms. He says, no other city ever endured similar calamities. Are, are, are the words of Jesus here true? You know, when we think of cities suffering calamities, we think of 9-11. Uh, the city of New York City was attacked brutally, unexpectedly. And it lost the two tallest towers in its skyline, along with some other smaller buildings around it. And, and that was a huge, tremendous, disastrous event in the, in the history of that city. And in our nation, we reflect on it today. But Josephus says, and he may be exaggerating a bit, he's sometimes prone to that. But he says more than one million Jews died in the siege of Jerusalem. And 97,000 were, we know, taken captive. Even the destruction of Hiroshima by the atomic bomb in World War II can't compare to that. Unequaled distress. Verses 23 to 28 to indicate that false messiahs are also characteristic of that time. They characterize the time around the destruction of Jerusalem. But Jesus tells us his return will not be in secret in verse 27. It's like lightning flashing across the sky. It's sort of an allusion back to a verse in Zechariah, as a matter of fact. So you should beware anyone who claims otherwise, who says that Jesus has come back, he's over here, come, come, you can see him. You say, no one does that. Well, yeah, they do. Uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses claim that Christ returned secretly in 1914 and again in 1918. And of course, you know the cataclysm that was surrounding the world in that day, World War I. These kinds of things characterize difficult trying Times. But moving on in, in the next verses, 29, 30, 31, Jesus talks about the end of the age and his return, the return of Christ. And the, the indication is the distress that characterized the destruction of Jerusalem will somehow also characterize the end of the age. It's a mystery just how that is going to come to pass, but Jesus indicates it will. He quotes from Isaiah chapter 13 and, and chapter 34 in poetic, symbolic, uh, or perhaps literal language. He says, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from the sky, the heavenly bodies will be shaken. Some say that's poetic, symbolic language. Others expect it to be fulfilled literally. There's no way to know for sure exactly what it will be, but it is consistent with Old Testament descriptions of the day of the Lord, that the day of the Lord will be darkness and not light. It will be judgment. It will be difficult. And in verse 30, when he speaks of the sign of the Son of Man, at that time, the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky, and all the nations of the earth will mourn. They will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. That sign of the Son of Man should really be interpreted as Jesus himself. It should better be read the sign which is the Son of Man. Jesus himself, as the rest of the verse suggests. And the trumpet will sound, it says in verse 31. Elsewhere in Scripture we read of the trumpet. Isaiah 27, Zechariah chapter 9. The Apostle Paul speaks of it in 1 Corinthians 15 and 1 Thessalonians 4. And then Jesus says, the elect will be gathered from the four winds, meaning the four directions, every direction. You know, it, it, one of the challenges of interpreting some of this is that language changes over the years. If, if we were to speak of that, we might say from the four corners of the globe. And imagine some person in a distant time looking at that thinking, a globe doesn't have corners? What are they talking about? But it's an idiom we understand, don't we? And Jesus says the elect are going to be gathered from everywhere, from all directions. Christ is coming to rescue 
the righteous from a world of persecution and peril and distress. Gregory Fisher was a missionary in Africa. And he taught the Bible at West African Bible College. And one day, one of his students asked him a question. The student said, Reverend, 1 Thessalonians 4.16 says that Christ will descend from heaven with a loud command. I want to know, what's that command going to be? And missionary Fisher said, I wanted to leave that question unanswered. Just tell him we shouldn't go past what the scripture tells us. But he said, my mind wandered to an encounter that I'd had earlier in the day with a refugee from the Liberian Civil War. The man was a high school principal, and he had been apprehended by a two-man death squad. And he was tormented for hours as these two men told him how they were going to torture him and kill him. And as, as God would have it, at an opportune moment, he was able to escape. And he ran and he hid for his life for two days He was finally able to find his family and escape to a neighboring country, but it cost him dearly. Two of his children lost their lives in that, and and the cruelty of that came back to, to the missionary's mind in that instant. And he says he also saw flashbacks of beggars that he passed every morning on the way to his office. He saw the the terrible destructive effects of poverty and disease how it robs people of their dignity and the best of what it means to be human. And those haunting images filled his mind. And the student brought him back to reality and said, Reverend, you've not given me an answer. What what will he say in that shout when he returns? And the missionary suddenly thought he's going to say enough. And the student was puzzled by that. Enough? What? What do you mean, enough? The missionary said, enough suffering, enough starvation, enough terror, enough death, enough indignity, enough lives trapped in hopelessness, enough sickness and disease, enough time, simply enough. One day, God will say, enough, and the end will come. Finally, in the closing verses of the chapter, Jesus exhorts us to be prepared for when God says enough. Verses 32, 33, 34, Jesus talks about this fig tree, a sign. When you see the fig tree blooming, you know summer is right around the corner. Different people have interpreted that in different ways. You know, back when I was young, how Lindsay was making a living, speculating on the end time, selling best-selling books. And, and he saw that blooming fig tree as the resurgence of the Jewish people and the establishment of the state of Jerusalem in 1948. But he said Christ would return before the year 2000 because of the, you know, this generation will not pass before these things come to pass. Well, of course, Lindsay was wrong about that. Jesus didn't come back in a global kind of way in the year 2000. These things Jesus speaks of in verse 33 seem to be a reference to all of the distress in verses 4 through 28. That may again be speaking of the destruction of Jerusalem, this fig tree symbol. But if it's a reference to the return of Christ, verse 34 could mean within a generation of whatever is symbolized by the emergence of the the fig tree. But the important thing in all of this, rather than trying to, 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 to dig out what the details mean, the important thing as far as Jesus was concerned, and therefore what should be important to us as followers of Jesus, is that we not be caught unprepared. No one knows when it's going to happen, Jesus said in verse 36. That hasn't stopped people from speculating, as you well know. But our task, according to verse 42, is to keep watch, to stay prepared, because it will come suddenly and unexpectedly. How sudden? Jesus said, like Noah and the ark. It took Noah a long time to build the ark. 
But the flood came on suddenly. Noah was prepared. Everyone else was not. Jesus might ask us today, how's your ark coming along? Where are you in your preparations for my return? How are we to prepare? Verses 45 to 51 gives a little story about that. Jesus relates it to a, a servant who is prepared. The prepared servant is the one that the master finds faithfully working when he returns, dedicated to his calling and his task. And that means doing what the master commands, putting our faith in Christ for salvation, following his will for our lives. That's how we prepare in obedience and dedication and service. On a trip to northern Italy, a tourist, I saw something that he considered to be a beautiful illustration of what it means to live in expectation of the return of Christ. At a villa along the shore of Lake Como, he was introduced to a friendly older man who cared for the castle's garden. The grounds were immaculate. The gardener was doing everything he could to improve their beauty. He was working daily, diligently on this garden at the villa. And the tourist was surprised to discover that the owner of that castle had not been there to see it in 12 years. And he was confused by this man's perfection in that the owner hadn't appeared in over a decade. So he said, you you keep this garden in such fine condition as though you expected your master to come tomorrow. And the gardener replied, no, sir, no, today, today. The master expects us to be prepared for his return today, not tomorrow. So Jesus says, watch and prepare. The servant who was not prepared suffers a terrible fate. The master, he says, will cut him to pieces and assign him a place with the hypocrites where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Watch and prepare. So, when is Jesus coming back? Well, let me tell you what I believe about that. Jesus said in verse 34... He said, I tell you the truth, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. This generation. That's confused a lot of people. But I believe that's true for us. Jesus was speaking down through the ages when he said these words. You see, the moment we take our last breath is the moment Jesus returns for us. In that instant. In that blink of an eye, we are immediately transported to to this end of the age experience. And we all experience it together, by the way. That's That's the miracle of the sovereignty of God. All of us experience it together. But for us, it's at our last breath, our last moment on this earth, Jesus returns for us. I've gone to prepare a place for you, he says. I will come and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. You see, I haven't been waiting 2,000 years for Jesus to return. I've only been waiting my life, which I hope isn't over yet. So less than a lifetime, my generation, that's all I've had to wait for Jesus' return for me. That's the longest any of us can wait, less than a generation. How much longer do any of us know will it be before Jesus returns for us? Jesus could come back today for all of us or for any one of us. Read this week of a pastor and his wife and family in Texas driving through West Texas in the night. A driver coming the other way must have fallen asleep, crossed the center line, hit them. Pastor and his wife killed instantly, left three children. Jesus came at a time when they did not expect. Thank God they were prepared. Are you? 
Are you ready? Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we take seriously the warning of your word. When Jesus was asked about his return, his concern was that his followers be prepared. It is still his concern. God, we know that. You've told us that in the word. And I pray that we might take that to heart today. As we see the strange signs going on in the world around us, things you told us to expect, Discord, strife, jealousy, wars, famines, earthquakes, pandemics. Lord, may they serve to spur us to a higher level of preparation in our devotion to you, our service to you, not knowing which day will be our last when Christ returns for us. God, speak into our hearts this day from your word. By your spirit, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As we reflect on the word of God this morning, I invite you to stand as Aaron and the praise team continues to lead us in worship today.
What are we meeting with? What are we going to be with this week? You can remember the name of Jesus. Jesus is with us wherever we go and whatever we do. If you have a prayer concern, if you have a need in your life, Dr. Hood and I will be out under the portico if you'd like to speak with us. If you're live streaming this, uh, send us an email if you have a question about uh, the name of Jesus. Let's pray together. Jesus, what a beautiful name. Lord, my prayer is that we would all be ready. Thank you for being with us this week. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. And our benediction today comes from 1 Timothy 1.17. Now to the King of Ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, to be honor and glory. Amen. Great week.